And so with that, Jay Aubrey. So thank you for the acknowledgement of the territories that we're on. I really appreciate that. And I think it's something that uh, really should inform and be the center of our discussion today. Because what we're talking about prisons and the practices of, of putting people in solitary confinement, it's part of this ongoing colonial violence that's being perpetuated by a colonial state against Indigenous people. We know they're overrepresented, disproportionately overrepresented in prisons and also uh, within solitary confinement. They serve harsher sentences. Uh, than any other category of prisoners. Um, and uh, so we're here today to learn about um, and to have this conversation about um, these, these folks, uh, the people who are incarcerated, um, Indigenous and otherwise. Um, but we're doing it on land that is stolen from those same people. So I think that's just a really important thing to just have front and center uh, as, as was uh, in line with the introduction. So thank you for having me here. Thank you for caring about this issue. Uh, thank you for caring about incarcerated people. Um, I think that that's uh, more so than any court case or anything we can do um, with our government. Uh, people caring uh, is the most important thing. Um, and I really appreciate the time that you all took to come out uh, to, to talk about this really important topic. So the reason why I'm here in Kelly's stead is because we just got a BC Supreme Court decision that struck down uh, the administrative segregation regime, uh, the federal administrative segregation regime. So for anyone who's not familiar, administrative segregation is just a pseudonym for solitary confinement. So it's the practice of isolating prisoners for up to 23 hours a day without meaningful human contact. Everything's happening, almost everything's happening through a food slot in their door. Um, so I'm going to use those terms interchangeably, administrative segregation and solitary confinement, because as many have found, the, the court found these are the same practices. I'm going to be talking about our federal correction system, which is run by Correctional Service Canada, and I'm going to refer to Correctional Service Canada as CSC. So anytime I say CSC, it's the governing body for our, our federal prisons. I also uh, just want to thank uh, Kaylee Tapuma, who was supposed to be here and speaking. She's uh, really sick and, and sends her regrets, but also Allison Latimer and Joe Arve. So they were our trial team on the case. Uh, it was a nine-week trial, uh, very little sleep. Uh, they were happy to do that. Um, it's the least we can do uh, given the atrocities that are occurring in our prisons. My role in the case uh, as counsel was to build relationships with people who had experienced solitary confinement um, to help them uh, put their evidence into a written form called an affidavit and then to prepare them for cross-examination uh, in open court. My job today uh, is, and I think moving forward at forever, uh, is to amplify their voices, um, to highlight their bravery. Um, these are folks who depend on Correctional Service Canada, CSC, for uh, the basic necessities of life, and they're in open court testifying public, public record uh, about against that party. Uh, so it's an incredibly courageous thing to do. Um, I also want to recognize the trauma that they've experienced and the fact that they were speaking about some of the most traumatic experiences that any of us uh, could go through. Um, and so just, just recognizing and being thankful for their voices despite their trauma, their courage and candor is really at the heart of the case. That's why we got the decision. Um, the judge repeatedly cited the evidence of, of the peop lay, lay witnesses, as we call them, people who have real experience, lived experience in solitary confinement. And so I'm going to talk about, highlight three of them. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about the judge's conclusions in the case or findings in the case in relation to, the, to these three people. So the first person I want to talk about is Amanda Lapine. Uh, Amanda is uh, such a beautiful, resilient, uh, brave person. I'm really lucky to call her my friend now uh, and moving forward after the case. Um, she's an incredible advocate for herself and for other uh, Indigenous incarcerated women. Uh, Amanda is a Métis woman who grew up in Gimli, Manitoba. Um, her grandparents were survivors of residential school system and they were her primary caregivers. Uh, Amanda testified uh, in the courtroom that from as early as she could remember, she was surrounded by the consequences of intergenerational trauma. Um, so substance use, sex work, gang activity, uh, childhood sexual abuse, um, and cultural genocide. At age 10, uh, Manitoba Child and Family Services removed Amanda from her grandparents and placed her in a lockup facility. Amanda experienced solitary confinement for the first time at age 10. By age 14, Amanda was incarcerated in adult facilities and put in solitary confinement on a range with, with adult men. It just makes you rage. 
One of the experiences of solitary confinement that Amanda testified about uh, was a situation where she was held in solitary confinement despite repeated recommendations from correction service staff themselves saying this woman should not still be held in solitary confinement. There's no reason for her to be in there. Um, she grieved after she got out of solitary confinement. She put in a grievance. Well, she did it when she was uh, actually in solitary confinement, but it takes a long time for grievances to be dealt with by Correction Service Canada. So, you know, a couple months after she was out, they concluded, yeah, you should never have been in there. Um, so in relation to Amanda's testimony and others, the court found that uh, time limits, clear time limits on the number of days a person can spend in solitary confinement are both achievable and necessary. Uh, it's a constitutional requirement. Uh, incarcerated people have a right to counsel, the court found, at their segregation review hearings. So we can try to avoid some of this nonsense where people are being held without any reason. Uh, whether they should be held at all in the first place is another question, but uh, the court said uh, you at least have a right to counsel. Uh, the court said incarcerated people have a right to independent review of their segregation placements. Right now the judge found uh, you have a warden who's acting as the prosecutor, police, investigator, and judge of their own decision. So they're just doing everything, every role that any other player plays in our traditional court system. The warden or their designate is playing all of those roles. And the court found that actually over a period of many years, uh, CSC has demonstrated that they actually can't be trusted with that role. And the court found that CSC uses segregation too much or solitary too, too much, solitary confinement too often when there's less restrictive options available. Um, and the court went through and discussed what some of those options might be and we have a question and answer period afterwards and I'm happy to answer any questions that come up for you about that. Another person I wanna talk about is Bobby Lee Worm. Uh, probably uh, if you're following the case, you've, you've heard of Bobby Lee. She's also incredible. Um, she's an Indigenous woman of Cree heritage and a member of the Daystar Band from Saskatchewan. Uh, her parents' addictions often prevented them from caring for, for Bobby Lee and her brothers. Uh, she was abused as a child um, in all the ways. Um, it's a really common narrative. Her involvement with the criminal justice system began at age 12. By 19, she was serving time in a federal prison. Bobby Lee spent 747 <laughs> consecutive days in solitary confinement, and more than half of her six-year sentence in total she spent in solitary confinement. Uh, she testified that she thought about killing herself for the first time in her life while she was in solitary confinement, that she hallucinated, that she became overly sensitive to loud noises and large spaces, which is again, very, very common. And most of all, uh, what got me about her testimony is she talked about feeling a profound sense of, of powerlessness. And she just so intelligently and articulately linked uh, that, that sense of powerlessness inside solitary confinement with the kind of abuse and helplessness she felt growing up as a child um, with all that intergenerational trauma around her. Um, I just wanna highlight uh, <laughs> something she does in her evidence, but uh, it's been called by uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, the residential school to solitary confinement pipeline. We're just taking people from one end of the spectrum and putting them into the other. Uh, this isn't a practice, residential schools is not a real, really a practice that has ended in Canada. And so this is a quote from Bobby Lee about her experience in solitary confinement. She says, since childhood, my sense of being able to control my life has been shattered again and again. This feeling of powerlessness worsened during the years I spent in segregation. While I was in segregation, I was literally powerless. Every aspect of my movement was controlled and under scrutiny. I felt like I'd been thrown in a hole and left to rot. And she describes the feeling of when you're in a small space, imagine being in an elevator for a very long period of time. Um, over time, the space gets smaller and smaller and she felt like it was sort of caving in her body. The court, uh, after hearing Bobby Lee's evidence and the evidence of others, found that administrative segregation or solitary confinement undermines the safety and security of the prison. So the rationale that CSE uses, uh, that they need to use solitary confinement for safety and security, the court found actually it does the opposite. Uh, it makes people more dangerous, makes society less safe. And the court found administrative segregation violates prisoners section seven charter right to security of the person because it causes significant psychological and physical harm and suffering. Um, sometimes harm that, that's irreparable, that's permanent. And I want to quote uh, the, the judge here, it's Justice Leask, paragraph 247 of the decision. It says, some of the specific harms, so this is based on international expertise, the evidence of, of these witnesses, some of the specific harms include anxiety, 
withdrawal, hypersensitivity, cognitive dysfunction, hallucinations, loss of control, irritability, aggression, rage, paranoia, hopelessness, a sense of impending emotional breakdown, self-mutilation, or also known as self-injurious behavior, and suicidal ideation and behavior. And that, importantly, it discriminates particularly against Indigenous people. The third and final person I want to highlight who uh, just, the bravery of all of these witnesses is just, you just can't help but be in awe of them in the courtroom. Their, their voices were so powerful. The, the court was completely silent as they were speaking. Um, and one that stands out in that regard is uh, Rob Roy, as the father of Christopher Roy, who was an individual who spent a great deal of time in solitary confinement. And Rob testified uh, that his son was calling him every week, once a week from solitary confinement. And on the phone, Rob was listening to his son uh, struggle with the isolation of solitary confinement and hearing him slide deeper and deeper into despair. Uh, on the second week of May, 2015, <coughs> excuse me, these calls abruptly stopped. And two weeks later, uh, Rob's son hung himself inside his solitary cell, as we know many have, have done. <coughs> and so the court found that, uh, based on this evidence and the evidence of other people, that administrative segregation and solitary confinement violates prisoners' charter section seven right to life because it increases the risk of self-harm and suicide. And that administrative segregation, and this is, I think, one of the most important parts of the decision, if you don't remember anything else from this talk, which I'm sure you will, uh, but if you don't, this is the part I would just take home with you. The court found that administrative, and hold our government accountable to in their, in their upcoming legislation that they're gonna put out uh, in response to this decision. Um, the court found administrative segregation for any period of time, one day, 12 hours, violates the Section 15 right to equality of all mentally ill and disabled offenders, that no period of solitary confinement is constitutionally justified uh, for someone with a mental illness or disability. So of course this decision is uh, just one step. It's, uh, it's not the be all and end all. It doesn't solve all the problems. Uh, this is still happening. Um, but I think it does uh, something really, really, really important. Uh, and it speaks, it speaks the truth of these people's experiences uh, unequivocally. Uh, really, really brave, brave decision from the courts. The, we've never seen a judge be so clear uh, about the realities that they're facing and also the lack of, of any trust that society should have for Correctional Service Canada to properly uh, use this tool in a fair or just way. So when I got uh, the decision, we got it a couple hours before it was public and, and we're supposed to read it and understand it and, and talk to people about it. Uh, so I crapped my pants, of course, <laughs> really. Um, and uh, I, so I was reading the decision and, and trying to process a, a whole whack of feelings. And, uh, and someone asked me the other day, like, what were you thinking at that time? Um, and I was thinking about my brothers. really hard to talk about this stuff without crying. I'm such a crier. Um, so I remember them as babies. I remember them as little children. And I remember, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the trauma that they experienced that led them, led them to the violence that they experienced later in life and perpetuated. And I remember how, how precious they are uh, at all times in their life. But I think often when we think about prisoners, we think about really violent people, and we don't think about that they're victims. We don't think about the violence that has been done to them. And I was also thinking about Ashley Smith. I've um, been thinking about her so much since. And her mom, and uh, all the other babies and children and humans that, that won't ever come back uh, from those cells. <coughs> and that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited uh, to see this film today, um, because this is a practice that's ongoing. Uh, it's not over. Uh, people are still being held in solitary confinement at the provincial and federal levels. And ultimately, uh, just end on this note, my sincere hope is that our criminal justice system, not just solitary confinement, but the whole system, will have a future that's guided by evidence-based policies, not historic practice. We shouldn't continue to do things that we're doing just because we've done them this way for a long period of time. That's not, that's not good enough. Uh, I hope we have a criminal justice system that can acknowledge the roots of crime, like trauma, poverty, addiction, 
and that we can confront and support those realities and that people who are engaged uh, in our criminal justice system will be supported and given the tools that they need uh, to live the lives that they were meant to live. Thanks. Thank you.